and then producing them in the metal is a fairly automated process. So we designed 50,000 different coffee pots. And to design 50,000 pots, you don't want to design every one uh, by hand, let's say. So I spent several months coming up with a family of eight curves, which you can see vertically here. And I designed the eight curves so they would all be sympathetic with each other. Meaning if you ever lofted a surface from one curve to another, you always got a surface that didn't intersect itself, that didn't fold on itself. They all are sympathetic, so you can combine them in any relation you want. And this is a matrix of, you know, close to 100 of those. We, again, automated the process and generated our set of 50,000 files. Started um, CNC forming those in my office to test them, which these are some of the kind of solid models in them. The idea that I have about innovation is that you very rarely hear somebody say, I found a way to make something with more parts. You typically find somebody saying, I found a way to make this with fewer parts. So the grips and handles and the heat transfer and the base and all the components, like a Michael Graves coffee pot has 200 parts, uh, mine has four. So using the calculus of surfaces, we integrated the ergonomics of holding on to them, as well as the heat distribution with two skins. So, you know, we generated the tool code, we sent it to this aerospace company, they cut molds out of graphite, two blocks of graphite, and we put two sheets of titanium that you weld around their perimeter in between the graphite, and you put it in an oven that gets all the oxygen pumped out of it, because it has to be like outer space, and you heat it to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, and inflate it with argon gas, and then light the gas at the very end, and it drives the soft titanium into the tool, and you get forms like this. We then take them out of the form and we give a robotically controlled plasma beam the path to cut them out. And it cuts them out and welds them together. And then to color them, uh, when you deal with a curved surface, a gradient of color always looks better because it accentuates the highlights of the curves more than a single color. So we then plated them with this uh, acid etching system where we change the voltage on a bath as we pull the things out. So they change from blue through gold to crimson as they get lifted out. And this is the kind of only non-industrial part of it. So anyway, this, you know, each one of these things you get in a mold, the mold it was made in, so you know there's no two. Um, so finally, I'll talk a little bit and, and tomorrow afternoon I'll talk about this idea of intricacy. But in a system like this, you don't have a whole form with details on it. What you get is a cloud of details, like a point cloud of details that makes up the form. So instead of having a surface that gets put together at its edges, you need a surface that's covered with texture and detail. So in this manufacturing, we're using the path of the tool to produce a new kind of decorative pattern effect. So, you know, from these are interiors. This is an interior we built in Stockholm, Sweden, using Volvo's car prototypers, actually, where we integrated all of the shelving components into the surface and textured the surface so that all the undulations of the surface had a corresponding undulation of texture and detail. Similar thing for an interior in Los Angeles, where we use the surface to produce its own skin, like a reptile. So everywhere the surface stretched, the detail and texture also stretched. And everywhere it contracted, it tracked with it. So instead of applying ornament, we literally grew the ornament out of the data of the surface. Ceilings, I mean, it all kind of is the same. The most sophisticated thing I've done was in collaboration with a painter named Fabian Marcaccio, where we did this installation at the Wexner Center. 
where we took the kind of the gestural stroke, which you see here in model study. We developed a texture pattern for it. We then integrated a digital painting onto that surface so we could move the painting across the surface to produce transparency and opacity through just the painted surface. We then textured it with relief. So those are the brush strokes literally in the geometry. We then found a, a forming company at Warner Brothers uh, Movie Studios and we also got a printer where we could pr digitally print big sheets of plastic and cut the molds in my office and then vacuum form these sheets of pre-printed plastic onto the molds and cut them out and assemble them to make a volume. So these are 250 3 meter by 2 meter custom panels that were printed and assembled. The apertures and windows track the geometry of the form. So instead of just cutting openings in them, we pulled the surface apart to make windows. We generated the texture on the, in and on the surface to connect it. And then this is some views of the finished object where all of these systems, the system of digitally printed painting, of literal painting, which some of this orange Fabian came back over and painted the relief on the surface, the apertures in the skin and the form is all working in a single surface. And it's a self-structuring surface in plastic. And this will be, this was just bought by the uh, Frankfurt Museum of Modern Art and it'll be open in a few months there. And just some of the details of how that surface and image and sculptural elements are all working kind of in a coordinated way. And to me, this is a new genre of design. It's not architecture, it's not sculpture, it's not painting, it's a completely new genre of surface work that kind of integrates the knowledge of these different fields, but produces an object. If, if you look at it as painted sculpture, it's disappointing. If you look at it as shape painting, it's disappointing. You really have to look at it as a kind of texture surface work. Uh, and then finally, this is worked up. I'm doing a tropical building in Costa Rica. It's, a, it's called the Ark of the World, but it's really three different museums all together uh, to attract tourists to the ecology. Um, turns out Costa Rica is the ecotourist capital of the world still, but everybody goes there to play golf and go to the beach. And so their idea, the president of Costa Rica's idea, is to try to get people to stay an extra day to go see the rainforests. So between the golf courses and the airport, which is a six hour drive, we're building this visitor center. Um, so the idea is people will come here to have lunch, go to the bathroom, take a break from the drive. They go into a main hall, which is in the center of this complex, which has information about the different national parks. And then where that central complex kind of tails off. There's a natural history museum called the Consilience Museum, kind of curated uh, on the E.O. Wilson's idea of consilience, which is all about ecology. And then surrounding that atrium are towers that have contemporary art by Costa Rican artists in it. So it's this weird mix of three typologies, which these are the plans. In the section, though, very much like the project in uh, Valencia in terms of part and whole. But in the section you'll see that it's this continuation across three different typologies to produce one mass. And like that project I did with Fabian, it integrates panel structure and texture with form. So in the section you see this main atrium hall, which is one building typology. The museum tower ring, which is another, say like the Guggenheim Museum in New York. And then the third is this natural history museum with these little ecological gardens punched into each one. All three of those building types are made with a single surface. So like the sociopolis, the housing project, one surface moves across all three of those systems. <coughs> 